Right, hello everyone. Um, good morning, I think it still is. Uh, very welcome. Uh, I'm just here to introduce today's program. My name is Michael Kirby. I'm the director of the Gothenburg Practical Multiplicity Program of Futures. Um, today's speaker is Professor Dana Cuff, who will be presenting a book that you found outside, which you can each, uh, each have a copy of. But before Dana speaks, uh, the former director for Mr. Over Futures, uh, Mr. Lars Schwarzschild, has asked to say just a few words since he was the one that initiated this professorship and the book also, I think. Please, Lars, just come on stage. Uh, thank you very much. I'm proud to introduce Dana Kaff, friend and colleague since many years from UCLA in Los Angeles, professor of town planning, basically. Planning. Uh, the booklet I haven't read that you, you have written about kissing it, basically. But I would like to say, introduce you to a book that you have, I have read. The Provisional City, MIT Press, it's about Los Angeles explaining how a city could grow from virtually nothing to 50 million in 50 years. It's very interesting from the point of view of the early futures of this world. Uh, you highlight three factors that was behind it, provisionality. I come from Lund, which, where we have managed to grow a population of 100,000 in, in a thousand years. That is not provisional city. <laughs> <laughs> but also scale, the scale of development sites, you could say, um, and mm -hmm. uh, ownership of property. The fact that uh, uh, during the McCarthy era, uh, the, the, the city development of Los Angeles became private, more or less, and public housing was not here. Uh, I think you should read it. It's interesting in a world where we're going to build cities for <coughs> 2 billion in the coming 30 years. And we have one, we have two options. One is to build like Los Angeles, Atlanta, Nairobi, and so on. Flat city. Out. Or we build dense cities like Manhattan, Shanghai, Singapore, or why not Curitiba, which was named the environmental city of, of the world in 1992 already. This is the real key question if we are going to achieve um, fire and green cities for 2 billion people more. And I think you should read. Dana's book, MIT Press, you can't miss it, The Provisional City. Dana, uh, my, my, uh, I think it's appropriate to ask you to <coughs> take the floor now. I have my mic. Is, is that working? Yes. Thank you, Lars. Uh, and thank you for bringing me to Gothenburg in the first place, really, so many years ago. Uh, it's because of Laura's that I'm here. Uh, maybe it's not because of Laura's that I stayed, which I really would thank Mr. Futures uh, and all the people here in Gothenburg who helped me during my work over the last two years. Um, I wouldn't recommend any city follow Los Angeles's footpath, footprint. Um, in fact, we're trying very hard to break out of it ourselves. Let's see if I can get this running. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so just to, before I get started, I want to thank a lot of people who helped me in this work. I became the Adlerberska professor two years ago, which is a shared appointment. I think I've never had a three-way appointment before, Chalmers, Gothenburg, and Meester Urban Futures. And that's meant that over the past two years, I've been coming to Gothenburg fairly frequently and meeting with a lot of people here in town, some of you who are here today. Um, to talk about what the future of the River City 
vision might be. Actually, before I came to Gothenburg the first time, Lars gave me a copy of the book that was produced from the workshops that were done in 2011. And I was kind of blown away by how impressive a process that was and looking forward to seeing what a city might look like that had such a progressive idea about how its future planning might evolve. Um, and I figured at that point, as, since I was relatively free to pick my own research project while I was here, that it would be out of that uh, River City visioning process that I would find the research that would be useful. And one thing um, that the people at Easter Urban Future said to me, and Lars in particular, was that I had to make myself useful. I was not to act like a traditional academic, which I do sometimes, but to actually um, make the work the research that I do somehow valuable to the people here in Gothenburg. That's a big uh, charge in a way because um, I'm a guest and I also am not a hometown person. Um, you know, I've spent my entire career studying the architecture of cities, but it's um, fairly imposing to think about talking to a city like Gothenburg about how to make the city of Gothenburg better. And I'm certainly not intending to do that. But I have spent these two years looking and observing at what's uh, been going on, and I have some thoughts about the challenges that are faced here, primarily through the words and interviews of the number of people that I've spoken to and the two years of studying uh, various housing developments around the Scandinavian South. Uh, and I hope that those will then be useful in the evolving planning project that is about redeveloping the river area and river neighborhoods. Um, I guess I would just want to add that one caveat, which is that I am an architect by training and a, a, I study the cultural issues of urban architecture. I'm not a sociologist. The object that interests me in all the work that I do is the physical and material built environment. And while I don't think that that material environment causes any kind of social change or um, uh, solves social problems, I think it plays a very important part, and it's certainly the part of our larger social questions that interests me. So you'll see that in both the handbook and in the work that I'm going to show you now, which is primarily a summary of the handbook, um, that, that the focus is on the physical and built environment. So here's what that River City Gothenburg visioning book stated, and which was so impressive, because it was uh, remarkably succinct, um, setting these significant guidelines for the future planning of the Gothenburg area. The goals or vision was to be, and these terms were used interchangeably, fair and inclusive, green and sustainable, and dense and dynamic. And I found those two terms being equated particularly interesting. And you'll hear me use the term dynamic and vital and uh, <coughs> magnetic and engaging uh, in a sort of equal terms. Um, the strategies then that were adopted by the City Council in 2012 to achieve this vision were to connect the city, embrace the water, and reinforce the center. So that's what I started looking at, what that might mean. This is very familiar to you. It was unfamiliar to me when I began now. It looks like my second home. Um, <coughs> Uh, these nine areas are neighborhood, and I suppose um, those remain more or less the same in terms of the vision, were the ones that were intended to be connected uh, and bridging across the river and made more sustainable and more dense and more inclusive. My own work then focuses on the Freehung area, uh, partly because of its status as the next major development, it's the central piece in this whole puzzle, and because of the Jubilee in 2021. Um, so, though this may be very familiar to you, since it was in 2011, uh, you might have forgotten a little bit. I just want to show a couple of the competition. It was not called a competition technically, it was called a workshop, and specifically so so that you see what it was that was guiding this uh, vision in the first place. Here is the solution by a group called Team East from Great Britain. Different nationalities were represented. Um, 
called Bridge City. That title doesn't really distinguish it from others since Bridge was a key part of every solution, I would say. Um, but you can see in this these uh, kind of um, uh, the psychogeography or um, situationist kind of notion of how you move through the city in that upper right hand map. Um, the basic idea was to bridge from the free port over to the old central city in this scheme. Um, that was in a, a very literal bridge. This is a scheme by Team Guler Guler from the Netherlands and other countries. Um, this one, as you might uh, see, is basically taking three districts as its uh, central starting point and then trying to make uh, links between them through green and open spaces. And this last one, uh, team, this is basically the Henning Larsen team from Denmark, uh, turned the entire Freeport into a park. Now, of course, these are the kinds of solutions we often get from competitions, which really are visionary, and yet are very difficult to realize because, of course, the you know, public funding for a park, the ability to get political support to turn the entire area into open space or shared space without the economic um, basis in development makes achieving visions quite difficult. The workshop process recognized that to some extent. And in the book, again, I think uh, rather uniquely um, interpreted all of those workshop schemes into a single uh, set of recommendations which were then to guide the overall planning process uh, there on out. Um, and you can just see in this two-page spread from that vision booklet that um, there was an intention of laying out much more specific strategies and tactics and actually specifications about what we will do in these we will kinds of statements and a series of other processes besides the workshop that involve school children and neighborhood groups, all of whom were then polled as part of this planning process. Um, and hence, in that amount of time, we, this project is actually under construction. The River City Vision is now in progress. It actually started, I'd say, to some extent in places like Lindholmen prior to the workshops, but continues uh, through Fehlebecken and Bakkeplan, and um, now it will move on to Freehomen. Um, but when you look at that new construction, it doesn't have the feeling of, uh, well, it's hard to tell if it's fair or inclusive. Um, it doesn't seem very green in any kind of literal terms. Um, and it's probably more dense. Whether that's dynamic or not is uh, partly the challenge that I think we face. Um, and these are not observations of mine. These are observations that come from everyone around the city. I think uh, those people who are involved in the various planning processes also recognize that the vision is not being entirely realized. And it was with that in mind that I sort of trying to ask what was missing. It, my first reaction was that it seemed as if the soul was not in these new developments, that it was missing something kind of profound. But of course, that's not a very um, solid research answer, nor one that um, architects could act upon or city planners. And so I thought I should take that apart and try and understand more fully, based on all of the intensive and important work that had gone on before, what might be missing from the planning and visioning process that could be used to inject new kinds of vitality um, and bring some new insight to the process. Some people would say that it's just a matter of time, uh, that uh, wait 10 years or 20 years, and this will be the kind of vibrant, inclusive neighborhood that we have in mind. But it seems to me that we should be asking more of our projects than just to wait. And so it's with this in mind that I'm now looking at what we might call the challenges and responses um, to how to be, learn from that work that's gone on in the River City development thus far for what might be occurring next. If I were to diagnose the problem uh, in more analytic terms, I'd say that those um, competition solutions 
determined that what we should do is create bridges across the river, create substantial public open space, and build linkages between the different independent parts of Gothenburg. Yet the tools that we have at hand in cities doing redevelopment projects are more like those elements in the center. We're, what we have at stake is planning and then the means to attract development interests in to help us enact our planning goals. And we do that through the mechanisms of literally representations like plans, diagrams, uh, the sort of conventional tools of planning practice. In some ways, uh, the planning profession is much stronger here than it is in the United States. I think that was one of the things that I've come to learn over the 10 to 15 years I've been coming to Sweden is that planning actually gets implemented here. We sort of make planning uh, master plans in, in places like Los Angeles and set them aside and they stack up and then you're done. Um, no one ever does anything with the plans. Here it's quite possible to build a plan and it's not always a, a, a great solution either. Um, so those tools that we have are representational. We also only have certain kinds of resources for intervention like the finance uh, finances and Swedish um, you know, transformation from a full-blown social welfare state to one which is really much more engaged, particularly here and somewhat creatively, as a public-private kind of urban revitalization project is the tool, a tool that is both constraining as well as the opportunity for how we might realize visions like the River City visions laid out in the first book that was adopted by the city council. Um, we also have only certain kinds of public capacity. The different agencies in the city have different kinds of expertise and um, that becomes the tool and resource for how we implement uh, the vision itself. Henning Larson comes into town, gives us a good idea and then goes away. Um, and then we're left to try and figure out what to do with it. I say we now, I mean you, I suppose, only I feel like as my second home, I'm with, it in, with you in it. Um, so then what I think was um, a straightforward conclusion of this set of diagnoses and tools is that the responses end up looking like conventional solutions. Uh, this is a, a kind of diagram or a schematic plan for the Freeport, and it looks a little bit like what we already have in Gothenburg, more so than what we might like to see in the future. Um, it's excellent planning that takes place. Uh, this is for Eastern Kvilebeken by Anders Svensson and uh, the Gothenburg City Planning Department. Um, it's, it, it's extremely important and very thorough, but it's probably not sufficient for producing this vital, uh, intriguing, varied and diverse neighborhoods that we hope to achieve. It is well planned. Um, so it's not as if we have different goals either. So it's not a matter of trying to achieve other uh, ends. I think everyone's ends are more or less the same. Uh, it's not even politically or culturally controversial as long as there's an inclusivity in the process. So you see these same kinds of images in every idea about what urban revitalization and urban renewal today should look like, which is very different historically than it might have looked 20 years ago or certainly 50 years ago. But um, the idea of a sort of active pedestrian streetscape, a careful street section, the integration of different kinds of transit systems are goals that end up somehow in these kinds of drawings, which I think we can all recognize, or at least I hope I've convinced you, are not particularly adequate to the task. And so here we have the Freeport with its new solution and uh, in a schematic form, I would just like to show you that really it's a kind of extension of Kvilebeck in, in some ways, and you might say of the kinds of solutions that are often uh, developed, particularly here in Scandinavia, a kind of high density perimeter block. It also is a, a standard modernist solution to keep land uses separate. 
So what I'd like to say about this lower image is what it embodies, what it implies even before it's built. And these things persist regardless of how much intervention we then impose post facto. So what's persisting in this is the idea that there's a dominant master plan, that it lays out building envelopes as well as land use, that there's a strict separation of land uses, in this case primarily park and open space and housing, and that it simultaneously, and perhaps this is the one that you know as well as anyone else, it implies a single developer working with a single building type for the housing. It, it has a large scale set of implications at all uh, of those levels. So, what does it mean to go beyond the convention? Um, of the, if, if part of the problem is that our conventional solutions are no longer appropriate for the contemporary city, and here I might just make a slight aside to say many things that I'm saying about this are about Gothenburg in particular, but actually the uh, problems and projects and challenges that Gothenburg faces are global projects and problems and challenges. So the idea that uh, affordable housing, that there's a housing crisis in all major cities. Uh, that housing is being implemented primarily by the private sector globally. And that private sector housing tends to be not affordable. And therefore, there's a push at this point in historic time in cities, particularly in industrialized countries, that uh, people of means are having a harder and harder time affording this housing that's inside the city. And people who have fewer means, who are poor, are being pushed out of the city. It's primarily sites along waterfronts that are the sites that are most attractive for this housing for a variety of reasons, partly because of uh, industrial and manufacturing restructuring, but also because of the amenities the waterfront offers. Um, and simultaneously then, the push because of global uh, warming and sea level rise and the desire for greener cities overall makes that focus uh, one that we share and that would put Gothenburg in many ways um, at the forefront, if we could figure out here how to do that well. Um, so, can we, if, so each time I'm thinking about this, I'm also thinking about my subsequent research projects, which are to write about Gothenburg in the context of larger global cities and the architecture of those cities and how they will evolve in the next 20 years. Can we create greater vitality in the new parts of Gothenburg is the fundamental question that this research asks. Um, if the standard components of vitality at every historic period, we've had some kind of consensus about those components. In modern eras, it was one. In the medieval era, it was another. Here today it is mixed use, transit oriented pedestrian oriented spaces with brown floor retail, housing density, 24 hour activity, quality design, street landscape. Um, it doesn't say anything about sustainability in that because that's another kind of performative quality. But I wonder if we have to ask some new kinds of questions then, since that doesn't produce what we have in mind. And I think we see that in cities that implement this. Maybe we'd say the cities that develop those neighborhoods or transit-oriented districts are better, but they certainly aren't the kinds of cities that we think um, need not improve further. <laughs> um, so what are the new considerations we might take into account? Maybe we have to ask, what do we do first? What, what's the first step in this process? What kind of activity, or, or can, can we create something like hotspots or intensifications of activity so that as it builds over time, recognizing that these neighborhoods will change, we focus our attentions in one place rather than uh, a kind of blanket approach to making a little bit of retail or a little bit of activity everywhere? What's the scale of intervention that we ought to be operating within? How do we deal with social inclusion and gentrification and displacement? What kinds of new policy innovations might we need to uh, effect or invent? And how do we deal with the agility or the need to evolve when we have such effective planning regimes? This was really where I began the work. Um, 
and talked with a number of people around the city about what this might be in Gothenburg's situation. And of course, there was, again, high amount of agreement that, yes, of course, we should be focusing activities, say, around transit stops or around transit nexus points, um, that we needed to work at smaller scale interventions, um, that policy was necessary. And yes, of course, we had to be agile. But it's easy to agree to those kinds of principles without knowing exactly how you might go about it. There was perhaps less agreement about how to deal with the questions of uh, displacement and gentrification, revitalization, and with that we would have to place historic preservation. And now I'm beginning to show you some of the imagery that I'm going to bring to the rest of the talk, which comes not only from Gothenburg, but from other parts of the world. Um, and I focus more on parts of Scandinavia than you might see here, about how some of these issues have uh, been raised in other cities, and in many cases how they've been solved in other cities. Um, part of my uh, challenge to myself uh, as an academic, it's, easy, it's very easy to be critical and to uh, focus on the problems. It's much more complicated to focus on solutions. As uh, scholars, we're not necessarily trained to, to do that. So um, the handbook is entirely about pushing that research into showing best practice kinds of examples. So I would say that um, we see this problem of gentrification and displacement also in cities globally. It's not a new problem for us. Uh, when you look at a place like New York, where Cat's Deli is getting saved, it, it's sort of a wonder whether or not Cat's feels like it still wants to be there by the time that's all over, um, you know, sort of dwarfed by the surrounding uh, development. It's easier in a place uh, like in Portugal to do um, affordable housing rehabilitation when you have a beautiful housing stock in place to rehabilitate. The center of Gothenburg is such a place. It's much harder to figure out how you do that on the northern banks of the Gota River, where there isn't an existing historic housing stock that would preserve something beautiful and timeless. Um, and instead, what happens now is that we have projects like this one in San Francisco, one of the kinds of waterfront projects that I was talking about earlier, where a whole pier, this is developed by Forest City developers, um, is taken as abandoned. To some extent, that's the way parts of the northern banks are being considered. Um, and turned into something that has the look, at least, of social activity. And this is the way all of those renderings always look. There's a farmer's market. It's always a Saturday afternoon on a sunny day, no wind, no rain, and it's packed. Um, that, that's probably better than the, it used to be, which was just with one mom and one child with one balloon walking through. Um, <laughs> It points out, at some level, what we've come to realize in architecture and planning, which is much more complicated to undertake, and that is that as we plan new pieces of communities, not just uh, cities, we're really planning them as places that have social and physical uh, synergies, that we must be planning events or actually designing the program simultaneous to the physical environment. And, and that isn't something that we train architects and planners to do. Um, but it is something that I'm sure we will be training them to do in the coming 10, 10 years. I would predict that happens fairly quickly. Um, but uh, I, I see flaws and strengths in that San Francisco project. It's the kind of setting that we're dealing with here, which is there's not a lot of uh, existing material structure to put your teeth into it as a planner or an architect to build around. In the what comes first question, uh, within um, design strategies, there are several answers to that. Um, it can be infrastructure-led development. Uh, in New York, uh, Central Park was a public space generated a uh, city in parts of New York, upper Manhattan, really began with the park and the development occurred around it and it was spurred by that activity. Chicago is doing something similar as a kind of reinvention of its downtown now. And it can be infill-led development, as with institutions. Uh, maybe the Salu Holland um, infill is such an institution type 
uh, starting point. For the most part, that question wasn't one that was up for grabs here because it was really housing that was needed, housing developers that could be enticed to come into the city, and thus it was going to be a housing-led development which sets certain kinds of problems that made me focus specifically on housing while, we were, while I was doing my work here. So here we see some of that existing context. It has some character, but you have to have a loving eye to find it. Um, <laughs> And it's vast. For the most part, it's unpopulated, though we know uh, from uh, research that's gone on since that visioning process that there are populations there who um, have a voice and need, a, need to have a voice. Um, but it's, for the most part, filled with warehouse-like spaces like these. Um, and that sea of concrete isn't something, of course, that you need to try to photograph here. It's just in every image one ca captures. So from that visioning process, there was a clear recognition that temporary measures, given how vacated or vacant that original um, site, at Ringwood and uh, Freeport especially, are, that temporary measures were going to be a necessary part of this. And I think these are some of the most exciting things that are happening in the uh, process and how those are um, held onto and uh, how they will have a life that's brought by the young team that's inventing these temporary measures like uh, rollerblading and um, sailing for kids and uh, farming and outdoor theaters, uh, how that can, community building that's going on can be retained and given life through the development process is an extremely difficult and challenging question in and of itself. There you see how they work with almost no means to get this established. And when they have just a little bit of physical environment, it gets even better in my mind. Um, because when you um, add large and small built elements to this community or events-based strategy, you get that kind of public engagement that is desired. Um, it has a cluster effect, meaning it generates more activity and more interest, and that has a kind of persistence if you can keep it going through the construction process. All right, so now I'm just going to move into these uh, challenges and recommendations. Uh, and again, I'll point them out. They're pretty well documented in the handbook. Um, and uh, they start with a challenge, they come to a response, and then I'll show you some images. So the first challenge that uh, was I identified, and I should acknowledge my co-author in this, uh, Dr. Per Johan Dahl, who was a doctoral student of mine, who I met when I was in Sweden teaching at Lund many years ago, and stayed with me to do some of the work on the handbook that you have in your hands. Um, so the challenge is that new developments construct vast districts overwhelmingly dominated by housing and lacking more heterogeneous cosmopolitan fabric. In fact, you can barely get a cafe or a grocery store to stay in these developments in the first 10 years. About the only thing that survives is a child care center because both parents have to work in order to afford the apartments. So what you see when you get to these developments are uh, the child care workers pushing s oceans of little kids to the parking, uh, park areas and through the streets, which is lovely, but of course anyone who lives there wants more than that. And so on Saturdays and Sundays they tend to come more alive, but um, how you generate that mix when what we're building is primarily housing in an open blank field or tabula rasa is uh, an economic impossibility without subsidy. So what's the response to that? Um, it has to start with something like undermining the modernist zoning principles that we really begin with even still. Um, it was in the modernist era, era primarily for health purposes in the original uh, sort to separate land uses to keep um, agricultural uses or coarse rendering plants, the kinds of factories and industrial uses from housing, which when they were blended, tended to cause conflicts of interest. And so uh, over the 
from the end of the 19th century through the middle of the 20th century, we instantiated zoning principles that kept absolute distinctions between commercial, industrial, housing, and recreation. And that is now not the way we live. It's not the way anyone wants to plan cities. And yet we still have the conventions and systems that put that into place. So there are a few strategies for trying to figure out how to defy those principles and to counteract the homogeneity of the housing districts that that produces. Um, one is to make sure that we plan different housing types so that there are small to large families to singles, elderly to um, households with children built into the mix. That also is not something that's typically done now by housing developers who tend to have a recipe, who say that what we build is a two bedroom, two bath um, standard unit. We know it sells. We have our own uh, marketing and branding strategies, and that's what we do. In the United States, the banks won't lend on mixed-use projects very easily. Um, and in part, that's why El Stranden exists here, is to help make that kind of development more plausible as its own kind of public-private development entity. Um, it's also really important to break down conventional solutions by keeping as much of the existing building stock on the site as possible so that tabula rasa schemes can't occur so easily. In other words, anything that's worth, anything that you could feasibly determine as worth saving should be saved, even if it gets substantially remodeled because it interrupts the homogeneous conventional approach that's like a steamroller printing out a single solution. And the other uh, means by which we can break down the conventional solutions is by developing property boundaries within our master plans that are not single but multiple. And there are examples of that at Linchoping, for example, that are occurring here. Um, so here are just a few examples of the ways that might operate. It's a little hard to show some of these because they're behind the facades of the buildings. On the upper right is a building by Teeple Architects that's Cooperative Housing in Toronto where the residents own a restaurant and its kitchen uh, is a training ground for jobs. And so they actually have it's a jobs um, training uh, income property as well as housing at the same time. Um, I show the one on the upper left because it's a way in which residents start to change at least the facade and operate it so that it doesn't have that feeling of a sort of wallpaper of housing the way many large-scale housing developments have. And so you can express something about yourself in your housing uh, on your balcony. Um, and the one on the lower right is perhaps the most interesting, where small-scale units in the modernist era were always associated with poverty and something to be overcome. They've now become, uh, in most cities, a new kind of solution. Scandinavia is genius in this. Um, some housing units are like little ship interiors. They're so beautifully designed and planned, but that kind of micro unit, what's called a micro unit now in American housing lingo, of something like uh, 20 square meters for a, a unit that might be available to two people, means that there's entry level rental housing now that wasn't available for, before. And you see that in this lower scheme where there's, I think, 700 units in this massive building now built downtown by Michael Maltzen Architects. Um, uh, and it has a public space, and it was done at market rate housing without subsidy. It doesn't make for particularly good housing because the entry level is still pretty high, but at least there's a way to get in as a renter um, in places where there's a high rental market through extremely small units. Yes, five minutes. OK, let's see. We'll go through recommendations two through eight in 40 seconds each. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the regimes of scale and bigness that exist in the Gothenburg housing market are pervasive. Um, 
New residential developments are dominated by large builders working on large sites, leading to large districts without diversity or detail. And the solution to that is to break that down in every way feasible through exaggeration of small and intricate acts. And I would just like to show you a few examples of that as it happens architecturally here. You can see it's primarily at the ground plane that we look for that, for aberrations in the building stock that are accessible to the public. Um, and for the creation of means by which people can express something about what's going on behind the facade in the public domain, uh, as you see on the lower right. Um, this has had to do with that principle of trying to develop in agility or evolution into the um, housing stock. Rigid plans, so well done, constrain long-term projects. And because housing developments can take decades to realize Early planning decisions become like a lodestone around the neck of the builders and planners who put them into place, who have different ideas by the time they're done, let alone that the market may have changed. So the response is to build in some kind of agility by breaking projects into smaller phases and encouraging the evaluation of early phases to transform them to later ones. Probably the place that I think this has happened most effectively is at the High Line in New York. Uh, and we've watched it roll out from an original um, project that was heavily planted and very garden-like and beautiful and packed to one that's now, uh, everyone missed the original uh, natural landscape that was up on the highland, and so the new piece actually has left a field of weeds along its path. Uh, zoning has changed there so that up at that level there are open space requirements of the buildings that are put into place, and you see that in this building by Neil Denari, and a series of art installations that engages people at night, which changes regularly. It's a constantly evolving project, even in the complex uh, zoning and political context of New York. One that um, my colleague Perry Johan Dahl brought to this, I think, more effectively uh, than any other, is the idea that we needed to deploy something that we call design thinking, meaning that as the city agencies in planning and parks and traffic each have their own expertise and each uh, take a project like a baton in a relay race, okay, now me, yeah, now you, now you, and some of them being more powerful than others, that there needs to be some mechanism by which the integration of all of those concerns is secondary to the effective creation of a new neighborhood, regardless of all of the other, or with all of the other feeding that overall goal. Um, and so the idea in this, and this is particularly an architect's conceit, is that through design one might be able to um, project and propose a project that, the, that would show the overall vision, as in the Gothic, uh, in the Gothenburg Handbook, um, so that the specialists understand what it is that they're working towards. And I think this is really, uh, if Lin Shoping evolves as it was originally intended, it's what its strength will be, that there was a design idea by Okidoki Architects here in Gothenburg um, that had many of the principles that I'm talking about in mind um, with a design thinking uh, that put it into place. And uh, the other project is one by the French architects Lacaton and Vassal, who've really um, upgraded, made more environmentally sound, and expanded the public housing in France um, without engendering higher rents, which was a very creative invention on their part. Everyone here agrees that the um, emphasis on infrastructure and transit has created barriers to pedestrian life. And it's uh, a, the a primary challenge. The response being not just to bridge over that, but to do that creatively and with hybrid forms. We see many examples of this occurring worldwide now. People are in cities across the world are seeing their freeways and aqueducts and um, train lines as uh, barriers rather than as the continuity they were originally planned for. And huge decking projects are being proposed. I just want to show one that I think is particularly creative and implemented in Seattle, the Seattle Freeway Park, which was done by Weiss and Manfredi, where you can see that um, 
the one part of Seattle is connected to its waterfront over a rail line, a highway, and it's done through a series of parks and a museum installation and a sculpture garden. Um, not unlike a kind of problem that you might say Gothenburg faces. This one is perhaps the most difficult in a Scandinavian context um, because the perimeter block is such a established convention here and, and because densities now are needing to be so high that the perimeter block is a kind of uh, easy answer. So the solution to this um, kind of automatic default response of the perimeter block is that we at least should be creating mutations to that to get a diversity of unit types, shared open spaces, and skylines. There's a predictability in the perimeter block solution that kills the streetscape on the outside and presents relatively predictable interior spaces. Um, so that, in fact, I think there are lots of reasons why the perimeter block should be challenged. Um, the one by big architects in New York on the right is a, a crazy, looks just like any per perimeter block in plan, and when you see it in the rendering, you can see it's a completely different form. Um, I think the one by Land Architects in Paris is uh, perhaps more relevant, where you can see a perimeter block can be made as an infill project with a great deal of variety and still openings back out to the street. And I'm just about done. Um, the notion of a radical increment is something that we've been working on extensively at my research center at UCLA called City Lab. Um, it's a means of thinking about small scale interventions that aren't just single little solutions, but one that catalyze further um, development and activity around them and could in fact proliferate in other parts of the city. Um, that's what I mean by a, a radical increment. And the idea is to um, take the challenge of the master plan and get finer grain detail that generates a kind of synergy of its own. I think this project by Tetrarch, Tetrarch Architects uh, in France um, is a kind of solution that would be relevant to the Ringon um, industrial development, where you start by adding small pieces that then activate new uses within the warehouses themselves. And the one that I've been working on for what seems like now a decade, and it nearly is one, um, is to create infill housing, uh, what we're calling the backyard bi biome, um, for Los Angeles city lots, where we could double the density of the single family dwellings by the addition of a very sophisticated and easy to build um, environmentally uh, sophisticated additional housing units. They're building one, the one that you see in the upper right right now while I'm away and I'm hoping it's all going smoothly so that we can install it on the campus at UCLA when I get back. Um, the last one is an interesting one, which is that many of the housing developments here have a kind of indifference towards the water's edge, and I'd say that comes in three ways. One is that the water's edge is taken as a given, rather than as an arbitrary boundary that can be manipulated. The second is that it's primarily seen as something that you use for views, rather than engagement. And the third is that the pedestrian path along it is sufficient. So somehow beyond those three solutions, we need to come to some new ideas about how to really engage the waterfront. Um, these are Sluice Holman, images from Sluice Holman up in Copenhagen where they left a little of uh, these fishing huts as part of the scheme and had docks instead of yards. And a beautiful project uh, by JDS Architects in Denmark called the Iceberg Dwellings where paths and views actually shaped the entire development. Uh, which then got the requisite path along the waterfront, nonetheless. Um, so figuring out how to weave a kind of lace-like um, and natural, as well as occupiable landscape along the boundary between the housing and the water uh, will be an important way to give some new vitality to the developments. So it's my favorite image of Gothenburg. Um, it's from Gothenburg to the world beyond. If we're to connect the city, embrace the water and reinforce the center, we also have to build neighborhoods and communities 
so that the next Gothenburg is one that we want to live in and that includes all of those who are here who need to be closer to the center and whose uh, diversity will actually bring the vitality to the city itself. As I've mentioned, these ideas that are specific to Gothenburg and to Scandinavia um, also have some generalizable qualities that um, are confronting waterfront cities worldwide when we face sea level rise, housing shortages, uh, social inequity in immigrant populations and the economic disparities that those breed, as well as the transformation of shipping industries uh, and fishing into new urban landscapes. The Freeport can be a model for building not just new housing but new neighborhoods in the contemporary city for the Jubilee in 2021 and for the much larger world beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Uh, we were not going to be too early for lunch, so we still have time for questions. Okay. So, Marie Verlaine will just run up and down with the mic. Go ahead, please. was so definitive, or, or it came from you. So it's as if uh, I should ask you questions again. Yes. Uh, I can talk about it. No, no. Um, they, they say there's never anyone loud enough <laughs> for the recording, but. Just curious, uh, the, the design model for Finn on them, which is the sound, yes. how, how far is that in development? Is there a chance of coming in and, and changing things? Is that a reality? Oh, I think that there's definitely a chance to infect that or influence it as it's moving along. It, it, you know, there's an idea already about where the uh, of general land use is, is my impression. I haven't stayed up with it in the last four or five months, but I can see nods that, um, in fact, it is still possible to influence. And I think the imagining is that as developers are brought in, that that would be something that's negotiated through the Dittal plan. Um, and it, it must be possible to influence those kinds of uh, plans. Whether that gets completed in full by 2021, I think is almost an impossibility. But, um, but, but I think that's also a good thing, to try to rush ahead with a large scale project and build it in six years. Uh, would not yield the kind of results that I think everyone is hoping for, which is results that are much more carefully wrought uh, than that. So yes, get involved. <laughs> During the city planning, obviously. No, no, more involved. <laughs> Actually, I have a comment to that. We have some do you have a, a response to that? Great. <laughs> yes, All thank you. Actually, we are some people here working with Freehand. Um, and are in the middle of the process of a uh, series of, series of uh, three workshops now Great. with the developers, really uh, trying to get a transparent uh, inclusive process as well. Yeah. And we have had already two presentations in the Ed room. It was last yes, week, so and we will have another one following up um, in Freeham next week. In two weeks. <laughs> yeah, it's a short time. Great. So we were trying to uh, attack the problem <laughs> yes. of making it more inclusive. Uh, yeah, it's an uh, interesting but also challenging way of um, trying to work, working processes within the city and from the city planning uh, departments. Yeah, I, I think that that's something that was clear to me in all the work that I've done here is that everyone is, as I said, it's not that the goals we're looking for, it, no one argues about that. Everyone knows what it is we're trying to achieve. How to achieve it is the question and how to upset the very processes by which we depend upon, which is our current city planning, uh, the kinds of developers who do the housing here, is a complicated project, even among the willing. Dana, yeah. um, you mentioned Lin Chuk, and very briefly. Did you go there? I did not visit, but I spent a lot of time with Okie Doki Architects. Yes, yeah. indeed. I can tell you, if you haven't been to Lin Chuk, it's a very interesting project going on where they try to join 
the university area and the city area, which is three million kilometers um, away. And it is small scale plots, yeah. basically. Right. So there are small scale contractors who do it different than in yeah. their own land. And all ground floor is three meter high so that you can have business there if you want to. And uh, I'm proud to have been part of the jury in this competition when we selected Okie Dokie uh, from Gothenburg without knowing that it was, uh, it was by far the best proposal. I think it's something that where Rinchev is trying to do what you're talking about. For sure. Yeah, I think it's one of the promising, really promising examples. And the idea of actually designing the property boundaries, which is some, it seems natural to think of it, but because I think the modernist uh, tabula rasa is the developer's delight, basically, what they would like is a completely clean site so that they can do everything as easily as possible. And their um, will has governed along with just basic principles of planning, that that might yield the best results. But I think it's exactly false. And that, in fact, designing property boundaries has a tremendous potential to influence the overall vitality and diversity that comes subsequently, in large part because it gets a lot of different builders involved. You don't do it arbitrarily, on the other hand. It's not like you just uh, you know, create different property boundaries and hope that they uh, oddities of that will produce hybridity. That that's not a very good answer. So we have two more questions. Hi, Terry. My name is Luke Dean. I'm here from China. I'm working with urban logistics, uh -huh. and I always wonder if I see the city vision uh, illustrations from architects that there is there is never, 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 never uh, delivery when uh, waste collection week or so in these illustrations and. Um, we have then a hard time to have efficient logistics afterwards in the cities of Italy. That's interesting. And I'm wondering, and also I followed these um, complete streets design yes, in the okay. United States uh -huh. where there's almost never a truck mentioned either. So, uh -huh. it is the, now that we've the, even made alleys uh, green and habitable, I don't know where the trash is going anymore. Yeah. It's also supposed to be green and lovely. Right. Yeah. So, it's still mm -hmm. the case that city architects. There's nothing about logistics. Though. Well, so my caution would be in that, that that's one of those kinds of efficiencies that has tended to take on a life of its own and thus then drive something. So if we get uh, sanitation specialists involved, you can bet that we'll have a sixth lane involved you know, in the traffic planning and that it will be made just so sanitation workers can have a perfect and efficient means. Just like now we have <coughs> tramways and uh, you know, fast traffic and pedestrian traffic and slower traffic and bike traffic. So uh, I think the important thing would be to keep that concern active in light of all of the other activities we have in mind. In some ways, it, it points to this idea of not um, planning cities according to the, what we would call the silos or the independent uh, departments of each set of interests. So if the trucks, if Volvo makes smaller trucks, it's easy to have them on, you know, smaller streets. And you see that happening in medieval parts of cities where actually the um, infrastructure is the vehicular infrastructure, not that we plan for the most efficient truck that we could invent. Um, but I do think that it's important to have logistics in mind. And it comes up when you're doing the planning anyway. So when the buildings get put into place, all of a sudden, all of these loading dogs have to be implemented, and if they haven't been considered, uh, they get they interrupt um, what might have been otherwise a great pedestrian street environment. So yes, they must be taken into account, but integrated with others. There right. was one more question, or did uh, I just I, talk too long to get that? One? I uh, I think Ulrika is signaling that we need to go to lunch. Lunch is getting cold. Thank you so much for coming out today. I really